We need God's Spirit to guide us. We need God's Spirit to come and to be here. And I know that, well, you know what? Let's do it this way. Because as we talk about God's Holy Spirit and God's Spirit at work in us today, I know that there's a lot of confusion of what the Holy Spirit is, who the Holy Spirit is, and how we receive the Holy Spirit. And so as we studied in our Bibles this past week, as we've done our day-by-day reading, we've got to read about the Holy Spirit acting in the lives of many individuals and groups at the same time, of the early Christians in the book of Acts. And I'd like to turn to Isaiah chapter 44. If you have your Bibles, this is a neat read. I've only got one verse up here that will be here. But I'm going to read verses number 1 through 8. And I think there's something here in this passage that we need to have our eyes opened up to in order to understand the truth of God's Spirit and the hope that we have. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. By the way, Israel literally means one who struggles or wrestles with God. And as I pointed out earlier this year, as we talked about Jacob wrestling with the angel, that we as God's people today are people that struggle, that wrestle with God. We are people that are willing to grapple with him in the midst of the confusion of what's going on in the world today, of maybe even health problems or financial problems, and say, God, I will trust you. I'm willing to struggle with you in the midst of all this. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb, and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land. Randy, I don't know um, how God's Spirit guided you to give that communion talk, but the whole time you're talking, I'm like, he read my sermon notes. (laughs) I will pour water on a thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. And here's what the Spirit does. I will pour my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob and another will write on his hand, the Lord's. The name himself by the name of, and name himself by the name of Israel or the name I struggle with God. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock, I know, not any. Isaiah gets this message from God, and it's a powerful message where God says, I'm going to pour out my spirit. It's going to happen, and it's going to be good. And then he says this about the pouring out of the spirit. It's going to be good for your young ones. It's going to be good for all of your descendants. Pay attention to this. But as we get into the book of Acts, and as we read what is said in Isaiah, our focus gets to those ancient people that are called out to be the people that the Spirit is poured out on. And we get distracted by this idea, and I don't know about you, but as we've read through the Bible throughout the year, it's kind of hard to remember the promises that God made, made to Abraham as you go through. Because you look at those promises and you go, oh, I'm not sure those promises are for me. Because it's made for the Jewish people the Hebrews, the people that came out of Egypt, the people that followed the law of Moses, that went to the temple and knew all about that culture and all about that history. Not necessarily about me. I don't think I have any Jewish blood in me. And so we read those stories and we forget that God said over and over and over again in the promises, the covenants that he made with his people, that you will be a blessing to the nations. We usually just remember the parts that you will be blessed and have a promised land. You will be blessed and your children will be many. We read about how David will be blessed and that he'll, um, be his, his son will sit on the throne forever. And we read about the focus and we look at those stories and that history and how it focuses on them, on that little small sliver of land on the east side, southeast side of the Mediterranean and how everything was focused on that point how God spoke and lived in them and through them and 
it seems like only in them. But we miss those parts as we go through Scripture, as we, if we focus on that, about how God had priests that came not from the Jewish people, such as Melchizedek, or Balaam who lived far off, or how Abraham actually came from Ur, the Chaldeans, of how God's word was throughout the whole entire world. And we miss that those covenants pointed to a truth, that the good news, that the people who struggle with Israel, it's for all of creation and for all of what God's doing. So this past week in our day-by-day -day Bible reading, we've been reading in Acts, and we started last weekend around the, the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit pours on the apostles, and they get tongues of fire above their head, and they go outside in that morning, and they're speaking in tongues in languages that other people, 12 other nations, hear them in their own tongues. Interestingly, there's 12 apostles. They hear 12 different languages. I don't think that's any language that you can't understand. They, hear, they understood them. And Peter begins speaking, and he says, these men aren't drunk because they thought they were drunk, as you suppose, because it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. It's still early. He says, the Spirit has been poured out on them, has been prophesied. This good news has come, and the good news has come because you thought Jesus was wrong, and you killed him, and he rose again on that third day. And he truly is the heir, the promise of the covenant that God made through David, the Davidic covenant, that there will be a king always on David's throne. And he lived into that. And so the people said, what should we say? And interestingly, these are all nations coming together, but they're all Jewish people celebrating Pentecost, and it's all focused on Jerusalem. They say, what should we do? And Peter replies to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, for your children, your children's children, and the generations that follow you until the end of time. He promises them that the Holy Spirit will be poured out, that they'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that they'll be saved by the blood of Jesus by repenting and following him and being in him. But it's still focused on the people that actually wear the name the people who struggle with God, Israel. And so as we continue in the book of Acts and continue on to the story, you got to read stories about, I don't know, people like Stephen who were full of the Holy Spirit and he was very Jewish. He knew God's story incredibly and shares it to the high priest in such a way. He uses God's story to call out the high priest and say, it's always been about focusing on God, not focusing on us and our power, and our money, and influence, but it's about what God is doing in this world. It's about what God is pouring out. And he ends up being able to see heaven, and he's full of God's spirit, and it's an amazing story. And you continue on, and you even get the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. It all looks like it's focused on Jerusalem, because the eunuch is coming to the temple. Actually, he may have just been leaving, if I remember right. And um, they're told to go out and meet him, and to go into the desert, and it's just outside of Jerusalem. And the Ethiopian eunuch is a proselyte, somebody that wants to be Jewish. And you still have the focus on Israel and God's people that wear his ancient name of the people who struggle with God. And he's baptized. And he follows Jesus. And it seems like, and you can look this up too, because there's still Christian churches, some of the most ancient ones in Ethiopia. Seems like he goes back down to Ethiopia. He's a servant of the Queen Candace during that time, and he shares about Jesus. And people in Ethiopia follow Jesus and become Christians. But yet, the focus is still on Jerusalem. It's still on the people of Israel, and it's still a tight focus where it's always about those people of Abraham that can trace their ancestry and not about anybody else. But then we get into Acts chapter 10, and something changes, something amazing happens. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 2 reads this. At Caesarea, Caesarea is a port town on the north part of Israel that is about as far from Jerusalem as you can get. At Caesarea, there was a man, a man named Cornelius, a centurion, of the co or a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. What we need to know first about that is that this man is clearly defined in the book of Acts as not being Jewish. 
he is of the Italian cohort. And if you look up that information, what you'll end up finding is that the Italian cohort is a group of a thousand some odd soldier, and he was a centurion. He's over a hundred of the so those soldiers who came to Caesarea to work and serve for Caesar during that time, and they were all volunteers from Italy. They were people, they were men, soldiers, that were drafted in and decided to stay soldiers and to go over to a place where there was a lot of turmoil and riots because that's how the Jewish people were to Rome and to go and serve there. And the next verse tells us something about Cornelius that's amazing and that we need to pay attention to. Cornelius was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. What we find out about this non-Jewish person is that he is a person that wrestles with God, that struggles with God, that wants a connection with God. And do you notice what he does to connect with God? I think this is really important as we talk about who we are as God's people and what we should be doing in order to connect with God and be God's people. He feared God. He studied God's word and got to know God. He gave to people that were in need. He took care of the widows and orphans. He gave alms, which means to give to the poor and take care of them and to give to them. And then finally, I think this is so incredibly important for us as people of God. He talked with God. As a man who probably felt so incredibly distanced from God, because during that time, they believed that God was in the temple in Jerusalem, that that's where the place where heaven and earth met. That was the only place you could really connect with God. Maybe that's why he joined the Italian court, so that way he could get closer to Jerusalem and just maybe feel that much closer to God. During that time, he prayed to God and communicated with him and wanted connection with God. The story continues on and says about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in, the t in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms, your giving to the poor people, have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon Peter, who is called Peter, he is lodging with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier, and among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So he gets a message from God and says, send for Simon Peter. He doesn't even know what's really going on. He just knows that he should be finding the Simon Peter and that God is happy with the man that he has been with the man who fears him, who is seeking him, wanting to be closer to him and connect with him, and we could read him between, between the lines there, who might not have ever felt close to him because he's not Jewish. He's not of the covenantal promises that were made as far as the Jews have been declaring throughout the centuries. And wondering if he can connect, if he's really good enough, if he can connect. So God says in the midst of that, Go ahead and go meet Simon Peter and find out more about him. So Simon at, Peter at this time is a little bit south by the sea, by the ocean in Joppa. We're not really certain why he's there. I'm not sure scripture really explains it. Maybe he's having a vacation. Probably not. Maybe it's because of the persecution going on in Jerusalem during that time. He ends up with Saul and all that bad stuff Saul's been doing. He ends up at Joppa and is planting a church there and working with Simon the Tanner to plant a church. That's probably what is going on. So Peter, being who he is, why the, those guys are coming to meet him, which says the next day, as Cornelius' men were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour, which is lunchtime, to pray. And being that is lunchtime, he became hungry and wanted to eat. And Peter is given a vision as well during this time. See, when Jesus left, when Peter, James, John, and the other apostles saw Jesus ascend into heaven. Jesus said this to them in Acts chapter 1, that all power and authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And he says, go and make disciples. And in Acts, as opposed to Matthew, it says, first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then all, to all the world. 
Well, so far they've been focused on the bullseye, the middle point, Jerusalem, that place where heaven and earth meets at the temple. And what's interesting, it's the same place where Jesus gave his life in the curtain tour. And they've been focused on that and focused on Judea, and now he's focused on Israel. He's at the outskirts of Israel in Joppa, but he's still focused on the Jews, the Jewish people. And so, while he's talking to God, interestingly enough, this whole story starts with Cornelius praying, and now we've got Peter praying and talking to God. Peter is given a vision. It says that God put him in a trance. And so what Peter sees is this blanket come down from out of heaven, and in the blanket are animals, lots and lots of animals. And a voice says to him, Peter, kill and eat. And we already just read because he's hungry. And Peter responds and says, I've not let uncommon things enter my mouth. Or, yeah, he's, he says that. And he says that this is unclean food. This is not the way us Jewish people are. We're not supposed to eat snakes and reptiles. We're not supposed to eat these things, these birds that have these different characteristics other than chickens and the stuff that you told us to eat. There's only a certain type of fish that we can eat. We can't eat catfish. I see an elephant in there. We can't eat elephants. And God says to him, what God has made clean is good. And then it happens again, and he responds the same way, and then it happens again, and he responds the same way. I wonder every time that I wonder, Luke didn't put this in here, but I just wonder if Peter doesn't connect to the other times that it happened three times to him. Jesus said, you would deny me, and he denies him three times that night that Jesus is arrested. And then after Jesus rises again, he's there fishing, and Jesus meets him and has breakfast with him, and three times Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And he says, take care of my sheep. I wonder if he's connecting to that and connecting this story going on. So Peter's still wondering what's going on, why he saw this blanket come down from heaven three times, why he says to God three times, I don't eat unclean things. And God says, it's okay, I've made it clean. And he's been wondering what's going on. And at that time, Cornelius's men show up and they come and they take Peter over to Cornelius. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Well, what we read in Isaiah chapter 44 with the outpouring of the Spirit, it sounds like it's all focused on God's people of Israel, on the ancient people. But Peter looks at this and goes, Oh, we must have gotten something wrong. We must not have understood because God had to show me with the blanket and animals coming down that there is another way, that a way that is of God and that is good. As for the word that he sent to Israel preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning with Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. So he says, you guys all know, and he's probably talking to Cornelius and his family because they have been there long enough to know this, how God anointed Jesus to be the Messiah. And that anointing was in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Do you see that he's still focused on the Jewish nature, the, the ancient people, the people that struggle with God? But they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead, to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Peter witnesses and recognizes that the vision that's given to him is that they have been short-sighted to the kingdom of God and what God can do. And his eyes are open and he realizes that everybody that trusts in God can be the people that struggle with God, can be those that are saved. 
And, and Randy's metaphor and his, his story that he shared, everybody can get in the boat and trust in the direction and go and float and be good in God's kingdom and be right. So Peter replies in verse 34 through 35, I love the way the New Living Translation says this, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Brothers and sisters, I know that this happened almost 2,000 years ago. And I know that supposedly we don't show favoritism anymore. But I want to call us out. I think sometimes we do. I think sometimes that you and I, because I know I've thought this, think that there are people that Jesus cannot save, and so we don't talk to them. We're scared to associate with them because we're scared that their, I don't know, their dirtiness might rub off on us or their, whatever it is that we don't want to connect to might not be good for us in our walk with God. I wonder if we need to have our own blanket vision where God says, what I make clean is clean. And we need to have our eyes opened up to the truth that there are people around us that sometimes we overlook either because of handicappedness, because of the color of their skin, because of their, how wealthy they are or how rich they are, whatever it is, we are short-sighted and we miss this truth that Peter eventually gets and Peter proclaims profoundly and sees by the outpouring of the Spirit that this is true. I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. And the reason why we need to see this, brothers and sisters, is because he shows no favoritism to us as well. Jesus came to seek and save the lost regardless who we are, regardless of the things that we've struggled with because through his spirit, he can guide us in better directions than we could ever walk in on our own before. I don't know what it was that you've struggled with before following Jesus, but if you've been living and following his spirit, you've walked out of some things that have made you clean, that has led you and cleansed you from the struggles and the guilt that you have struggled with before in the past. Because that's what God does. God saves, God heals, God pours out his spirit and gives water to a dry land and fills up rivers that the trees and the life may be abundant and may be good. God brings beauty to what was darkened, to what was made bad, what was broken. And he brings healing and rightness to this. And so Peter notices this and says, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. Brothers and sisters, may we be like Jesus and quit showing favoritism. That doesn't mean you can't have your best friends and the people that you connect with and your family that you get along with and hang out with and you're comfortable around them. That's okay. But it's not okay if that's all you do. Jesus called us out into this world to be uncomfortable at times, to have courage, to be brave and to step up into a world and wonder how, what God is going to do because God is doing something that is beyond our imagination and our means, our ways to know. And our whole goal is to connect with that and be where God is going in that direction. And we're not going to do that if we always sit in our comfortable seats with the people that we're comfortable with. But it will happen if we trust him and be with the people that God is with. And we're those people. <laughs> we're the people God is with. We are the sheep of his pasture. And he calls us out to that. So I encourage you, at times this week, be willing to talk with somebody that makes you uncomfortable. As long as you're willing for the Spirit to guide you and to give you the right direction as you go. I find it really interesting in the book of Acts and at the end of Jesus' life in multiple places, it says for the people that follow God to not necessarily prepare for this, like be lawyers and this, have this long oration as a response of what you're gonna say to people and their differences. Instead he said that all throughout scripture it says, let the spirit guide you. He will give you the words to say and to know what to do and to love. And I love the truth that as you see all these people that the Spirit are guiding is they're eating and being with people. Peter even mentions this as he goes to Cornelius' house. He, the very first thing he says when he gets there, by the way, <laughs> this is a really bad evangelistic strategy. 
If you're going to somebody and you're like, yeah, I wouldn't normally come over and hang out with you because uh, you're different than me. <laughs> They're not really going to listen to you very well. Peter gets to Cornelius' house and he says, you know, Cornelius, because you've been hanging out with us Jewish people long enough that we don't go and eat at Gentiles' houses because it makes us unclean. But God has shown me a better way. God has shown me that the promises that he had made that we've forgotten about, he keeps his promises. That all the nations will be saved. He continues on, while Peter was still preaching and saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. What's really amazing about this story is in Acts chapter 2, as they're wondering who they're going to be and what they're going to do because Jesus went to heaven, and as they just gotten the 12th of uh, the, the replacement for Judas with Matthias. They're all there in the upper room wondering what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit pours on them and they find out what's going to happen and they go in the direction the Spirit guides them and comforts them too. Well, as he's there sharing this good news, sharing the word of God with Cornelius, the same exact thing happens. And it says that Cornelius and his family were speaking in tongues and I think this is powerful. It's not necessarily the speaking in tongues part that the Holy Spirit leads towards direction in. We get so fixated on that. I, I, I think we need to be more fixated on the purpose of speaking in tongues, on the purpose of the direction of what the Holy Spirit does. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues, and what were they doing in speaking in tongues? Extolling God. They were saying, great is God, God is good, Jesus is Lord. They were praising God and giving all glory and honor to God. Instead of being speak and focused on if they were speaking Italian or Hebrew at that time or Aramaic, we need to be more focused on what the tongues were doing. And when Peter, James, and John on the day of Pentecost are speaking in tongue, Peter says very clearly in a sermon, they were sharing the good news of Jesus and him crucified and risen again. And guess what they're probably doing right now? These Gentiles, these people that are not of the people that struggle with God but are welcomed and invited in in the midst of their differences. Look at what they're doing. They're praising God. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they are praising God. So Peter speaks up. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. There's something wonderful and powerful here. And again, Randy, thank you for your communion talk because this, this is the direction that we need to focus on. There's something wonderful and powerful here that we find out happens as a means of being in the direction of praising God and being somebody that gives to poor people and that loves what God is doing in this world and his salvation. They begin by being like Jesus, by following him by following him in baptism. Peter's remark is this. He looks around and he's like, what's going on here? We weren't supposed to even know that the Gentiles could do this. We were supposed to stay in Jerusalem and Judea. We ain't even gone into Samaria. Well, actually, they had gone to Samaria, but Peter's like, what's going on? And he finds out that everybody who trusts in the Lord can be saved because God shows no favoritism. And so he encourages them to be baptized. It's interesting because he actually, in the last verse, it says, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Please don't take that word command as a, like, a, um, this is an order for the Italian cohort. This is what you have to do as a general. That's not what's being said here. What's being said here is, this is a gift in the direction of what God is doing in this world. And to join into this direction, here is what you do. Here is who we are. We are people that join Jesus in baptism. We're baptized into his name. Brothers and sisters, again, there's a lot of confusion in this world about the direction that God is going. But if you look at scripture, it's pretty simple. Here's who we are supposed to be. We are people that take care of poor people. 
Like Stephen, he was there to help the Grecian widows to get food because it was a struggle for them with the six other deacons that were called. We are people that feed, that take care of other people that are in need. We are people that are there with the sick, with the needy, with the lost. We're people that love on others because God does not show favoritism. He loves all of his creation. We are people that trust in his ways. And that when Jesus is baptized, we don't say, huh, I wonder about the theology of baptism and if we should do it. We just go, oh, Jesus was baptized. I'm going to follow him. And I'm going to trust that this is a place of cleansing and renewal. And as Randy shared with us about the river, a place where our sins are washed and gone, pushed away. And we're going to be people that talk to God. We're going to be people that pray because he answers. He listens to us and he answers. The whole story of Cornelius starts with Cornelius was a good man, a devout man that feared God and gave alms to those that were in need and he prayed. We'll talk to him because we believe that is the direction that the Spirit guides us. Brothers and sisters, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us. We need, Jesus promised us that the Spirit would be a comfort, would be a guide for us to give us the direction that God would have us go so that way we quit showing favoritism and we have our eyes open to the true kingdom that God is building here. And so when we pray in the Spirit, the, the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, we praise your holy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying in alignment with the Spirit because that's what the Spirit does. He builds God's kingdom and he builds it here now. I want to encourage you this week to pray for, to give to, and to be with somebody that doesn't always make you comfortable. Somebody that seems to push against the kingdom of God. Because God has declared through Cornelius that he shows no favoritism. That he has called us to be a light in this world, a light into the places of darkness, and to step forth and to say, God's kingdom reigns, that Jesus truly is Lord, he is risen again. I encourage you to do that. I want to pray the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. If you need prayer for anything, please don't hesitate in coming up here and having us pray for you. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective, as is written in James chapter 5. It's useful and it gives strength and healing because that's where God's spirit is, is in the midst of people that are living in his kingdom, that are struggling with him, and that are talking with him and helping others. This is who we are as a body of Christ. We are people that pray together. And if you've not received the gift of the Holy Spirit, the way is simple. Again, Peter said in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift's not just for Jewish people. It's not just for older people or younger people. It's for all of us. That Jesus came to die for our sins, and he rose again on that third day that we might live in his kingdom.